maybe grew too quickly, too soon. And we created this environment where we allowed mercenaries to come in and we devalued the missionaries in the space. Those mercenaries are good at getting grants. They're good at working the system. They're good at building communities. But then when they don't see the opportunity, they jump. And we're not an ecosystem that has room for mercenaries. We really can only focus on the missionaries. That was Ilamimti, co-founder at Antisocial Labs and a core contributor for the governance working group at the NDC. On this wide-ranging conversation, we tease out many things that really gives us an insight into where we are coming from when we approach some of the later heated topics about the NDC. There's a lot there about the counterculture of crypto, the vision for the technology, our past experiences that inform our views. As part of the warm-up, it also helps that we touch on some of the past experiences, including the NFT ecosystem and near and reminiscing on the Rod of the Near Foundation and how they handle that situation. It all leads up to a beautiful build-up for the current state of things and the vision for the NDC. It is worth mentioning that we had some ongoing technical issues. I had to pick up my phone and go for a walk. And that unusual setting probably added to the unfiltered and at times some would say unhinged nature of the podcast. Overall, this is a wild conversation and I hope that by the end of it, you end up with a much more informed view of what is happening, how you can contribute and join us in this conversation. Without further ado, I'll let you enjoy this spicy and quite ranging conversation with Yelamimti. Hello friends, welcome back to another episode of the Wild User Interviews podcast with me, AVB. Today, I've got with me the one and only Illuminifty. Did I pronounce hey it correctly? Yeah, nailed it. Excited to be here. Been a long time listener, first time on the podcast. So yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you, AVB. Oh, it's you. I see the analytics and I see all these downloads from the UK and I'm always wondering who it may be. There's so many people there. So <laughs> ah, it's, it's definitely me. It's definitely me. I honestly, your podcast is a great resource to get an understanding of the space without doing all the meet and greets and learning all the backstories. You really get a deep dive into some of the core people of the ecosystem. So it's, it's a pleasure. It's a great source of knowledge. If you just want to get like caught up to speed with who's, who's doing what. Thank you, fine sir. I wanted to propose myself that we use the guests of the podcast as a criteria for the OG SBT, but I suspect that we may be both preaching to the choir and getting a bit ahead of ourselves on the conversation, but yeah, I appreciate it. Now, I just want to start by saying that I really appreciate your work. I am probably someone that if you've been following me, people would know that I have had many observation views with varying strengths and strong opinions, but I have sensed a, a shift in the NDC governance working group and in the general sentiment around the NDC. And it can certainly be tracked to several people joining the team, including yourself. So thank you for all your work. And I can't wait to start unpacking all the moves in the background. Yeah, definitely. Look, I've been following the NDC for since its inception. So getting an opportunity to be hands-on with it's been very rewarding. A lot of us have been in this ecosystem for quite some time. We've seen the highs, we've seen the lows, especially my background coming from NFTs. I've seen the NDC as a last bastion of hope for us in the ecosystem, the opportunity for the community to be hands-on and help shape the ecosystem into the way we've always envisioned it. Being a part of the core contributors, being able to help yeah, bring that to life is very meaningful and rewarding. And yeah, I'm really excited to see how the next six to nine months unfold because I think it's going to be a very critical time for our ecosystem. I um, want to learn more about your journey into crypto and NDC, but beforehand, I wanted to congratulate you again because you sent me a fair bit of reading, including the NDC V1 GovOps manual, which I thought it was going to be horrible and dry and suck my soul. But I had the pleasure of reading this on public transport, and I must say, it reads really nicely. It's got almost, I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, so let's throw them under the bus. It almost feels yeah. like an exciting journey that you're going into. So with your permission, I'll just 
lay out the introduction with some dramatic reading. I may put some Star Wars music over it so that people know like the importance of everything we're about to unpack. Definitely. And I just want to say before you do, yeah, Ozzy, Ozzy Mandis is the person who's written the Ops Manual. So I think he's played a great job in making governance not boring. I love the kind of tongue in cheek banter style writing there is there. It's one of the few documents that like isn't dry in, in the NDC. I just want to give credit where credit's due. I can see that. Ozzy Mandias is the only individual to date that has been on this podcast twice. And we could easily have him a third time. There's just so much wisdom and, and vision in him. Okay, let's get started. Dear reader, this is a user-friendly governance operations manual for anyone interested in participating in the governance process of the Near Digital Collective. It is essentially a cheat sheet to how to think about the different roles, the possibilities inside each role, and the governance framework as a whole. Some of it will be boring, but potentially useful. Other parts will be probably spicy, and the subject of much use over time. Governance is not easy, but there is a nice arbitrage opportunity in knowing more than everyone else about how a system works. Read on to master the NDC and start your journey as a protocol politician on near. That's pretty cool. I'm excited to see what music gets dubbed behind it. We need to find something that it's not copyrighted. That's that struck <laughs> me before. But before we dive into this journey and we hold on to our listeners' hand and take them through the future of the NDC, I really want to understand more about you. Because I think I saw you in bits and pieces of the ecosystem over time. You know, those names and PFPs that you recognize. And then suddenly you are everywhere or you're very instrumental within the GWG. So yeah, welcome to your journey. Like, how did you get into crypto initially? And maybe then how did you get into Nier? Where, where does the journey start? Sure. So crypto, say that's 2012, 2013. And I won't go into too much detail, but you can imagine what a university student first coming off cross Bitcoin could do in those days and ages. And then smooth, uh, very smooth. <laughs> watching the ecosystem grow, seeing Ethereum come out. I remember trading Ethereum back when it was like $20 uh, and watching that grow. Then I was always an enthusiast slash a very awful trader, a very awful trader. <laughs> I learned like a couple of things very early on in crypto. And that is I can't slip NFTs. I can't trade like everything I do. The market does the opposite of and that's where it was probably 2022 when I really got into it in more of a building capacity. So this was on Phantom and we saw the rise of all the Ohm forks. If you remember the Ponzi coins that had 1 million APR and things like that, that's a very interesting time because that's where... Were those, first... were those all the like Ampleforth forks with the rebase and the... Yeah, the rebase tokens. Mm. So it was an interesting concept, but there I found like opportunities for arbitrage where the stake version of the token would trade higher or potentially lower on exchanges than it did on their platform. And so there was spread. And my professional life has always been in like the startups. I worked across a lot of different roles in like London startups across FinTech, PropTech, DevTech. And I had a pretty big network of developer friends. And so I tapped one of them up and this guy's ranked third in the UK's competitive coders. I was like, hey, I've built a basic bot that will tell you when they're spread, but it's just a mix of if that, then this and Zapier and just like pulling basic information that just pings in Discord. What can we do here? Can we go and build a bot behind this that trades, uh, the arbitrage trades this coin? And so as the whole rebased DAO tokens are dying, we turn like a hundred bucks into 10,000. And that was super exciting. And then one of my close friends tells us about NFTs and this chain called Near. And at the time, Nier was sponsoring one of the hackathons we were throwing. So that was like my first foray into the ecosystem. I didn't really know full stuff about NFTs, but I was told, hey, there's this blue chip coming out. It's called ASAC. You really need to check that out. And so the first NFT I ever minted, the first like five Nier I had in my wallet, I spent minting a picture of a pixel monkey. And that kind of started off my time in Nier. And like from there, it's just been like a massive rabbit hole down. We had a, a few friends, we liked building small little bots here and there. And so we started to just engage with the projects in the NFT ecosystem. 
we would build sniper bots for this project or that project. And our, our name got around. And then we ended up winning over the contract to build Near Tracker. So we put that together and brought that to market for the Bullish Bulls team. After series like small events, we ended up getting in touch with the anti-social, anti-social aid club team. And we pitched them, hey, you've got a great brand. You've got a great idea, but how do you build this? As a, how do you scale this as a business? Let's do something together. So we launched labs together. We started to build out for a variety of different people. And we went from having two developers on our team to ultimately 20. We built for a good 10, 15 projects in the space. And we ran a strong B2B business for a good, I'd say, close to 12, 15 months. And we saw through that journey, like near at its peak to near at its lowest lows. And it, it's been interesting. We can dive into the smaller parts of that later, but it was an opportunity to use a variety of different skill sets I built up in Web2 and really try to build out a different type of brand in Web3. While everyone's chasing royalties and quick flips, we're trying to think about how do you build a sustainable business and how can you drive enough value across the ecosystem? and like a software house, like a dev house is one of those things that just made sense. Now, it doesn't make you like a ton of revenue the first time you build something, like about 80, 90% of your revenue goes to paying developers, maintaining fees, all that stuff. But the real thing is then the second time you build it, that's where a lot of the margin comes into play. And so it was an interesting journey, but in that time, uh, I think everyone's experienced, right? Because one thing we realized in labs was that Royalties would never sustain a business. So your NFT collections can build you an audience and a consumer base and a product base to test with, but it's not something that's sustainable. In near, what can you do? You've got B2B or B2C. And the problem with B2C is that as a somebody developing a product, you don't want to monetize the end user extensively. Like transactional fees make sense, but if they're only like nominal and the, we tried to build out a tool set similar to the Fox Federation and Solana, a swap platform, raffles, and all of that. But the problem you come across in the near ecosystem is that you never recuperate your costs on building things. And so for us, it was build B2C tools through revenue we get from the B2B side of it. We build cool stuff for other projects. We use that money to reinvest back into our collection and build out more tooling that way. So that's like a very quick dive into my background into getting into Nier. And I'm sure there's lots of questions to dive. I have so many. That was a pretty good run of like 13 years of time. <laughs> no, I like it. And I really hope that I'm able to remember all the questions because I don't have my notebook with me right now, but I'll mention them to you as an outline. We'll take it out just so that you and I have it. I yeah. want to go back to the early days, what you were studying at university and I find that people often brush over that early stage of life, but most people that find their way into crypto have something in there. Usually it could go as back as whatever, like a seven year old, but there's like a seed planted there. There's some experience, some discontent, some sort of a contrarian belief that has been brewing. And then when finally crypto manifests, they're like, yeah, this is my thing. And it may not be obvious at times, but I'm really curious. What were you studying at university? I also know that you were in the US and you migrate to the UK. How does that personal journey look like? And can you identify any of these patterns? Yeah. Okay. So I think you're totally right on the, there's something counterculture about crypto, especially cutting in early on. And what drives you there is usually something that is like a deviation from the norm whatever that might be. That might be the need for anonymity. It could be a, like seeding a distrust with the way things are. For other people, it's just, you get open to, how do I politely put it, marketplaces that just aren't available in your local area. And so crypto had a very unique side to it. But in uni, so like I studied mixed anthropology and economics. So I had, I, mean, I was probably two classes short of a double major, but I majored in anthropology with a minor in economics. And then I applied to law school. I got into law school in the UK. The problem with being an American and moving to the UK at that time is that nobody wants to give you a loan. And so what do you do with an anthropology degree in the UK? You do sales like everyone else. It's, it's that or you go to Starbucks. And so I ended up in the startup scene uh, and just doing whatever type of role you could. And it just took me down this. Very exciting journey because I did three months in a corporate job and I hated it. 
I hated it so much. It was just everything I didn't want to do. You're on the telephone all day, but you have to wear a suit. What's the point? There's like a bell that rings that you can go and get your coffee or it's time for lunch. It was very Pavlovian. And it was like everything wrong with what I saw contemporary work to be. So like the startup scene and then Web3 as well, it's like it takes away the norms and it allows you to build them the way you want them to be. And so you are right to that like early point of people get into this space because of contrarian point of view. And I think that's been my, my journey like all along. So like Web3 just fit into there very nicely. Why London? Why London? It was my second to last year of uni. I came to London to visit my cousin for his wedding. And I happened to meet my future wife at that wedding. And after a, a year of long distance and chatting and keeping up, I asked her the big question posed and I got married. I got married at a relatively young age. I was 20 at the time. And the opportunities was either take her from London to the U S or go from the U S to London and her being like this awesome corporate lawyer in the city, totally has her life sorted versus me being just fresh out of university. It made sense for me to come to London than her to come to a small town in North Carolina. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause I, I as you were talking, I was wondering that because uh, if you have, it's an interesting thought process, right? If you have somebody, say, from Colombia and from Australia, most people would assume people move in one direction. But I find it hilarious that if you have the US and the UK, both good countries, I'm just really interested in the deciding factors because, yeah, definitely the decisions have many unintended consequences down the line, including the London startup scene and probably all the opportunities that opens up. They do. And it's something we put a lot of thought into, right? I think that dynamic also significantly changes when you have children. It's weird because as an American, you're super insulated and you don't realize it until you leave. So look, I moved to America when I was two. If there's anything I am, I'm basically an American. I spent my whole childhood there. I spent my university life there. And then I moved to the UK back in like 2013. And you realize no matter how clever you think you are, the kids in the UK are just more clever. There's just a better quality of education there. There are, especially in a place like London, there are a lot of opportunities, but then America has a lot of great things as well. Like the cost of living outside of big cities is significantly lower. The opportunity to buy property is easier. The amount of money you make doing the same role in America versus London pays way more in America. So look at a junior software engineer at Facebook. It's like the starting salary in like California when he put an alt works together like $250,000. That same exact role in the UK is more like 60, 70, 80,000. So there's like massive deviations for what roles pay. And the, like America, it's the big house, big cars, big people in the UK, especially London, no matter how much money you have, like saying your house is big is usually a very difficult thing to say. A, a big car is not the same in the UK as it is in America. There's all these little deviations, but after you have kids, that changes a lot because when you think about one, the quality of education, two, safety, and there's, there's a degree of randomness that happens in America for just things to go bad. The propensity of it still exists in the UK, but I feel it's a lot lower. You don't have to think about school shootings in the UK. And so that there's like a, a very like rational reason for us to stay in the UK versus the US, irrespective that the US may have like more monetary opportunities in the UK. You can't really put a price on safety. You can't really put a price on safety. Yeah, it's well said. Grass is always greener on the other side. I've been in Australia for 15 years and uh, oddly enough, I've never visited the UK. But I did mention in our previous call that from living in Australia for so long and we have so many similarities and we're so close to the UK, I told you up front, I am bullish on the UK mafia. I've seen <laughs> the talent from the foundation and projects in the ecosystem and just contributors in general. And there is something special about the British. Maybe not all of them. I do know that there is a rather messy, rowdy bunch, I guess, like every country has. But when you look at the vision, the drive, the operational excellence. There's something about execution that they really do excel at. 
And I don't know, I really don't know how to describe it, but the United States does feel a lot more complacent, messy. It says to me a lot that in the US, if you look especially at the most successful people of the last, whatever, 50 years, a lot of them are migrants. Like people come in with a migrant mindset. And it is true that the country gives you a lot of opportunities, but you need to have the hunger and the discipline to go for them. It's sad that the system doesn't really push people towards that excellence, to, to desire more. It's very strange, but it certainly seems like they've lost their way to some extent. Yeah, that resonates with me, right? I think there, there's a lot of opportunities in America, but those opportunities aren't just like out there easily to, for anyone to achieve. It takes a lot of blood, sweat and tears to get there. And you do hear about all those wonder stories of you've come from absolutely nothing. You come to America, you start at the bottom, you work your way up you're washing dishes or you're doing like manual labor and then you start to progress and now you own the whole hotel you've been working at or you started McDonald's as a janitor and now you own a franchise of five. Those stories definitely are like that, that American dream of you can come from nothing and build something up there for yourself, but that's not available to the people that just follow the traditional American system. You don't go to school and then that happens to you. It's those people that have come from nothing and understand the, what it is to be without and then taking it from there. There's just so many small things that we take for granted. And in the most extreme example, I've been thinking like, if you take a homeless person from San Francisco and you put them in Venezuela, they would be, in the most bizarre and strange example, they would be like a luxury homeless. It's not the same type of need. It's not the same type of poverty. Yeah. There is an entitlement and something rottening in America at every level from the richest to the poorest, that it really is hard to understand for people outside. If you look at most developing countries, they'll be like, if you have a house with a computer and decent internet and electricity that doesn't run out and you don't have to be worrying about water or about getting murdered if you leave the house, if you have all those basic needs covered, imagine being young and having the freedom to sit on a computer uninterrupted from seven siblings fighting to get access to the internet, your parents can't pay the bills, no interruptions. Anything and everything you can learn online right now. So yeah. th those are the small things where I'm like, sure, maybe you're not going to become the next multi-billionaire, but there are opportunities. And I think this is irrelevant because the blockchain space and the NDC, to some extent, is creating this digital nation. And as we try to think of how to create first systems for everyone, but also being realistic around where are the opportunities for growth in the ecosystem, who is in the capacity, who's got the skills and the ability to execute on the things that we need to do. These are all relevant considerations. You said a great thing there. I think it's a perfect segue into Web3. And the thing I really loved about it is for a lot of the world, Web3 opens up international or Western capital. I could sit here and buy a PFP for $2,000, $50, whatever, and think of that as an inconsequential cost. But an artist in a developing nation that puts that together and sells it for that amount, that could be a yearly income from one, one PFP. And so you look at how when skills get access to international capital, how transformative that can be. And it has a system of abuse as well, because if you take it to the extremes, one thing that I've always had an issue with Web3 gaming, things like Axie Infinity, is it takes everything fun out of games and just kills it, where if you've got whole communities in a developing nation all farming in Axie Infinity to be able to make a living for themselves in the real world, that's not gaming for me. That's not competitive. That is just, I'm glad those opportunities are created for people, but at the same time, that's like, everything I hold against I don't I mean, know what a good game should be. I know that you're deeper in the NFT world than I am, but is it really an opportunity? Because to me, art has always been a luxury. I don't know about you. I have never in my life bought art, not a painting. Maybe if I was working with a friend down, or I don't know, like, like a festival, they bought like artisanal earrings or something. I've got one real piece of art in my life that I got finessed off. I was in the honeymoon period of like my, my, my wedding with my wife. I was on the train one day from work and some artist walks onto the train with a bunch of his art pieces. And I was like, that's so sick. 
And so I buy like an art piece off of him on the train right then and there. It's this picture of the Eiffel Tower that's like oil painting on canvas. And I bring it home and I show my wife and I was like super excited. We go, we buy a frame, we put it up. And then I walk through the markets like the next week and I find 50 different copies of those paintings. Or just one of the copy cut paintings that artists sometimes do. And then I felt a bit like, oh, I got swindled. It's the same exact painting, but this person's selling for 20 instead of 50. It's still, it meant something to me at the time. So we still hang it up and we still have it. That's the only like real life painting that we have. The other ones that we hang up are the ones that my kids draw. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned that experience because I actually lied in my passionate general statement. I actually did buy one piece of art. When we graduate high school, there's like a trip to celebrate. In Australia, they call it schoolies, but in Venezuela, we went to the Dominican Republic. It was an all expenses trip, so I really didn't have that much money on me. And as you can imagine, 18 year olds on an all expenses trip that includes alcohol to the Dominican Republic, I was very drunk. And it was a similar story. I was not very conscious and I was walking through some little art stores by the beach. And I like this painting. It was very colorful. It had some like local structures and hieroglyphs. It just seemed to me very tropical and it just represented the warmth of the place really well. And I must say the salesperson was really good. It started at whatever price and I thought I was getting a bargain. They threw in some cigars and long story short, I basically gave them whatever cash I had on me. And I make it back to my hotel room with this painting and some cigars and my friends are, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> so anyway, I was embarrassed. And when I make it back to Venezuela, I show the painting to my parents. And to this day, that painting is in my beach house, which is now the house where my dad lives. Yeah, it raises a good point. It's like, what is the value of art and how does one appraise it? And the value of art is really whatever you believe it's worth and whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. And it's an interesting mechanic because it's one of these things that it's not a commodity, but when you bring into the web three space, it can be treated as a commodity and traded as one. And so there's a lot of like interesting aspects that are happening in web three versus the traditional world. And we talk about all the positives, right? The um, web three makes it e easier for artists to continue to make money from their artwork over time. Every time it gets sold in the traditional world, it doesn't really work like that. If you look at like traditional fine art, an artist might be paid 10,000 to make a piece of art, but that same piece of art is then sold for two or 3 million and they don't see any compensation from that. So there are like some of these benefits, but it also changed the, the general nature of art and how people react to it and relate to it. And it's like art is only valuable if other people find value in it and it stops being valuable when people stop seeing value in it. And I think. The web three is pushed that to an extreme where there are some really cool NFT collections with the respect to the artwork, but they were worth absolutely nothing. And that's because nobody sees the value in them for that. So it's uh... look as a rule of thumb, if you are in the business of valuing art and you care, you're most likely trading very high value art for very shady accounting purposes. Yeah. And I invite my listeners, especially the ones at the foundation in Switzerland, to look up the hangars that they have in Switzerland in the tax-free zones right next to the airport. Nuclear proof, fireproof, they trade hundreds of millions in artwork from one Harry Potter style vault to the other one. All the deals happen sometimes even in cash within the hangar. And who's going to tell you? Your accountant can't say that the piece of art was or was not worth something. So I think that understanding that troubled relationship that we have with art is one thing. But the second thing, when we take it to Web3, I think that we try to apply a really good solution to the wrong thing. Like, for instance, in Australia, by law, all the secondary sales of Aboriginal art have to pay royalties back into the community. And it is the same scenario that you mentioned. There are people that drive out there, whatever, 40 hours, remote communities, they buy beautiful traditional Aboriginal work, and then they come into the city and they resell it for 10 times the price and off it goes. But the problem, that the law is very hard, if not impossible to enforce. Like there's no traceability. You go to a remote community, you pay cash, and then you have a physical thing that is completely disconnected to the world, and then you sell it for more money. 
So that would be an example. And by the way, I mentored a team for a legal hackathon at my university. They won by using the near blockchain to solve this problem. So that will be an instance, okay, fair enough, there is a market for that art. But when you go to the opposite extreme and you look at some of the CFPs, the value was never artwork. The value was community. And this is where things started getting really ugly for me and why I tapped out very early. Because it raises the tension that you mentioned, like how can you monetize from your community? And by the way, I recorded episode 50 from Ready Layer One and I told them to delete it and never publish it because I was very, maybe emotional, but certainly not happy. I was very angry at some of these OG communities that we figured out that the minute that they could make more money elsewhere, they fucked off for the cash. And I was like, I don't know, there was something about it that just didn't feel like the incentives were aligned. And yeah, it just gets messy. So I think that for the sake of preserving real art, we should just stop pretending that PFPs are art. I think PFPs are awesome and they have a role, community, membership, there can be a bunch of branding, but they're not art. It's my controversial opinion. Yeah, I don't disagree with you on that. I see them and the way we've employed them was as a form of identity more so than just the art itself. And you do have one-for-one markets. You have Art Exchange on Solana. You have some really big Ethereum one-on-one artists. And there's definitely a space for that. I've definitely commissioned a number of one-on-one arts because you build this online persona, you build this identity around it. It's got this image. And then you want to continue that. So I had like my ASAC PFP and I wanted to see the anime rendition of that. And so I found this really strong anime artist and I got them to, I commissioned them to make an anime version of my PFP. I have probably seven or eight different versions of my PFP through different art styles that I really liked. But you're right, it's not art, it is identity. And I do want to touch on the offering a perspective of projects that went to other chains, because we did that. We launched a project on Solana. We felt the wrath of Solana as well. It was interesting. I was, how do I say this, like gently, I was first very anti going other chains and I've always been very much a near maxi, but then there's like a healthy sense of reality that comes into play as well. And that is that you want to drive value to your community and your community can be like, like at the end of the day, it's your community. It's not the near community. It's not the Solana community. It's not the Aptos community. It is the ASAC community. And if they don't mind exploring other chains, then it's not necessarily an awful thing. I get the like royalties and mint is not, I don't see it as a business model and it shouldn't be treated as such, but at the same time where I've probably taken a very aggressive standpoint in the past, I don't as much because it's like, what is the alternative? It's either you go and you find a way to raise revenue or you cease to exist. And that, that is where a lot of projects got pushed to in the near ecosystem a few months back. And it's one thing to go around following the hype and going from chain to chain. It's another thing to expand out and that is still know where your base is and still come back to that. And it's difficult. I don't see any project successfully minting out on near or using mint as a revenue vehicle, nor should they, but that market and that time and era is gone. And there are definitely other benefits to minting out an NFT collector for raising money. That's something I've been pushing for some time. And that is if you build a cool enough product, you start off with a thousand user testers or 5,000 or 10,000, whatever the number might be in the web two world, the hardest thing to get after you make your product is customers or users. And in web three, you start off with users. That's the exciting thing. And so understanding that dynamic and then building in accordance with that is like a cheat code. I don't think many projects realize that, that actually your mint means that you start off with like thousands of brand champions. I guess the... What I want to share with you is that there, my response to a proposal that we got for the marketing DAO, which was largely creative, I actually can't remember the specifics, but I do remember very clearly my reasoning for rejecting it. And I think that there are some probably some principles or some takeaways that we can get from that. What I told them was that blockchain opens up a lot of opportunities, specifically in developing countries. And I think that It is amazing that there are a lot of regions that have a thriving creative and art ecosystem, but the reality is that those are the only ecosystems that are thriving in some countries. 
because the economy is a disaster and there's being limitations placed on people just by failures, government corruption, failures in education. So my only message to them was that if we want to grow the near ecosystem in that region and considering the source of funding at the time, we really need to push the envelope. Like it wasn't good enough for people to just keep doing what they were doing before. Insert here any form of random art. We really had to show people how the technology could really elevate them. And we had to remove from them those limits that they had before. And I thought it was very ambitious and it should have been very inspiring and very eye-opening. And that's like where I sit with NFTs. I think that it's a nice segue because I actually wanted to ask you, and I think that you're a very good person to ask, what you think about the near position, which may have some similarities to what I told this group of people, these applicants, around never really being very supportive, if at all, of NFTs, quote unquote, as they were largely known in other ecosystems, because I can only assume here, I don't want to quote people, but I think that the position has always been that because Near is so powerful and we can do so much more on the blockchain, like product-wise and complexity-wise, there just wasn't much interest, or at least I didn't want to dedicate too much capital or talent towards that wing of NFTs. I'd love to hear your thoughts because I know that your team put a lot of thought and effort into an option there. Can you hear me? Okay, so I'll tell you what I've heard. And that was my take on the lack of support in for NFTs. And you weren't going to name particular people. You said you saw a similar kind of standpoint on the creative slash like individual marketing side of things. I can quickly dive into my thoughts on that if you'd like. Yes, please. And probably we can view it through the lenses of creating the culture of the ecosystem because the culture will obviously shape the governance, although that could be an interesting conversation as well. Does governance shape culture? Culture shapes governance. Yeah. So with that dynamic, there's three core areas. There's governance, there's culture, and there's economics. And we can dive into the NDC side of that soon. I want to talk on that topic as well. But specifically to this question, the general, let's call them powers that be, support for NFTs and taking kind of a reserved standpoint to it. I don't blame that. I think that's a rational decision to an extent, but there's not supporting every NFT project that asks for a grant. And then there's kind of making crypto natives second class citizens on the chain. And it's being conscious of where support should start and where it should stop. But also one of the core issues I saw is that money is not the solution. These projects, these like early great ideas require a lot more support outside of just a monetary point of view. So I don't blame anyone. I know it gets frustrating as like being a part of the ecosystem, not seeing that same level of attention and love and care, though I think NFTs are an important part of it because when you look at DeFi and DeFi is something that Nier did very well at one point. Every chain that had a very strong DeFi like ecosystem also tend to have a very strong NFT ecosystem. I like the two other ch chains I'd compare is like yeah, Ethereum and Solana, where DeFi, I guess Solana not so much in the DeFi nowadays. Those two things came hand in hand because I think NFTs offered a form of community. And up until NFTs were a big thing on a chain, you're doing stuff as an individual. But then it changes when you have this hub, you can situate yourself in and engage with other people. The biggest thing I found is the value add for the ASAP community was the different types of people you'd meet and the amount of connections you'd make. These were potential service providers you could use. There were potential teammates you could have. There were potential advisors you could have. There were just a variety of different people with a breadth of different experience and ideas that you could work with to do something. And so it was kind of a, a home for a lot of people. And each NFT community has its different vibe and its different take. The ASAP community is definitely very degenerate, if you will. There, it was like, the nice thing about it was there was no middle ground. You either loved it or you absolutely hated it. And that very quickly made a very strong identity. So you either a part of it or you were completely against it. I, I definitely liked the values that you could get from those type of communities, but at the same time, should it be the poster child of the ecosystem? And is that what you want to show everyone that comes through the door? For some people, yeah. And for other people, definitely no. Like it's definitely marginalizing. Now, like when it comes to like support from the powers that be, the issue is that, yeah, you shouldn't fund every 
other PFP project that comes out and their innovation, some staking platform or some type of like copy, pasta, BS. You're also missing a long tail of innovation that can also come out. And this is where I was most disappointed was Near has a tech stack that is unrivaled by any other layer one. And the opportunities to build something super innovative with the NFT tech stack, it is incredible. Like you could build, okay. So if you look at PFPs as like the first iteration of this technology of what you can do with it, great. And then the next thing you saw with it was like, people started building applications around it and ways to provide utility for their communities. But like that underlying technology is still super powerful. There's a lot of experiments we ran in labs. Like we built a shed load of tech that never made it to the public. So we built a bond type of system with NFTs, especially like near NFTs, they can hold your addresses and you can attach like assets to that. So your NFTs could hold NFTs, they could hold other fungible tokens. They could, you could drip feed them from one account into another account. There's some really unique mechanisms you could explore there. And then when you like tackle on some of the infrastructure being built by other parties in the space, there were some, I'm being super vague here, but yeah, like bonds as a service is something you could do transformative and dynamic NFTs, composability using like composability is an application layer. So if you have a certain trait, you can access certain things. These are all really nice experiments that can then bleed into the real world. Cause I think yeah. that the final iteration of non-fungible technology is it's blend with real world assets. So imagine all of the like traditional artwork having an on-chain presence and being able to fractionalize it. So I could never afford a Van Gogh, but I could probably afford one, one millionth of a Van Gogh. And every time that Van Gogh goes from a private art collector's hangar into a museum and that there's some revenue generated there, I could see a yield from that. There's these applications that we are building the foundations of now that will definitely apply to real world assets like fine arts. But we're talking about something different here. I feel like we went from the PFPs and the PFP community has been very vocal after raising hundreds of thousands of dollars and tens of thousands of royalties, they've been very vocal that they couldn't make a full-time living from a PFP, which didn't exist a year before. Like it's a really novel thing in the world if you think of people trying to earn a living. Those vocal communities were not the main base building core infrastructure and they have received a shitload of money to enable others to build on top of that core infrastructure. There were not a few on FARS that have raised millions of dollars and they're doing large brand deals. They were not, yeah. the list goes on. So we're going to be careful of not mixing where the complaints were coming from and where the people that we thought were OGs claimed to go multi-chain, left, didn't even launch on the other chain because the money dried up and they never came back. That is where my disappointment with some people was because they did represent something very meaningful in the ecosystem. And it did hurt us. The community was struggling for a long time to find its yeah. meaning. Completely demoralized. Lucky for us, the psychos that code have kept this ship alive. And we keep shipping banger after banger that you would have to be insane not to pay attention and not to want to stay because of the technology. Yeah. That's where the conversation around culture and governance comes in. Is the governance a bonus for near or a detriment? Because you and I know that for a long time, a lot of people saw it as a detriment. Like my decision to step down from the marketing DAO, I heard from many people. I saw what the NTC is doing and I sold. Near is becoming the proof of admin. The people that are good at getting grants and not the people that are good at building. These are all the criticisms that have been brewing over time. And that I know that you and I hold similar views. And there's a lot of work that has gone into place to make sure that the opportunity that we have to get it right is not lost. Two, two parts to that. One is the, the ruggers, the guys, girls, people that made something meaningful here at one point, but then completely threw that out the window for another chain. I can't speak for them. I can't speak against them. They're definitely a point of concern. And th those have become like recognized identities. And I think that when you give power to the community to decide, those people will not get any opportunity to take liberties of the ecosystem because where the foundation, for example, cannot necessarily understand the minutia of every single NFT project and the culture being built and all the things that are happening behind the fold, just because they don't have the capacity to do the ecosystem can, the ecosystem knows, and it doesn't forget. 
And when funding turns back on and some of these names come back into the space looking for funding, the ecosystem isn't going to be that laissez-faire about it. Hey, here you go. Here's another grant. No, they'll probably be very aggressive. We'll uh, tell you a, a tiny bit of outside just between you and yeah. I like to give some cookies, a handful of loyal listeners. You know why I'm really salty? Because I applied for the original expansion role in January. I got rejected within four days. The person who got offered the job rejected it to go work at Salon. And he's leading now. I don't want to say the country because I want to throw him under the bus. We've lost six months of no progress in that area because whatever decisions were made. So this is where I'm like, we need proxies to value who's contributing in their own capacity. Everyone has different interests and different skills. We're not perfect for all roles. And honestly, I would have probably not enjoyed being within the foundation. I'm much better as an independent agent. But it's just an example of, yeah, there's been, there's been challenges yeah. along the way. I share your concerns with the amount of roles I've applied for at the foundation and just not even gotten the time of day. It'd be one thing to get an interview and then get rejected, but just my CV probably pops up and is like just caught by the box and immediately taken down. I completely get that. I think there are a lot of very incredible people in this ecosystem that deserve an opportunity to really showcase their prowess. And this is where the NDC comes in hand, right? This is where now you don't necessarily have to go through the vetting process of the foundation. And I'm not going to lie, the vetting process of the foundation is intense and it's thorough and it's good, right? Like they have some real experts on their side designing and developing the way they vet people. So I can't fault that at yeah, all. Yeah, on the foundation side. I think yeah. they have been, I don't know, I mean, I'm wrong very often, but I think that they've been very good with hiring. If you remember the sentiment exactly one year ago, going into NearCon, this is when the Near is Now movement starts. This is when people are saying, what the fuck is happening with marketing? No one knows about Near. No one knows about these cool things. That's kind of like the, I'd say like the peak of the crisis, the Near is Now hashtag Twitter town halls that start happening, all the little groups are created. There was a really nice community that grew out of that. But the shift from NearCon onwards, which would have been about the three-month mark, I believe, from the new CMO, is dramatic. Like, it's barely recognizable. Everything's oh. in brand messaging, all the verticals. The BD team has expanded exponentially. Pagoda has expanded. The regional hubs. It's just very different. And that's why I'm often reflecting. The NDC is born, as I refer to sometimes, in light terms, as a way to fork the foundation. Because we're like, if it's not working there, we've got to find a way for the money to flow into things that do work. And there was a lot of frustration and despair. I think people can go to the forum and read some of the shit fight back in the day. But the challenge that we have now is that the foundation actually got its shit together. Yeah, They're doing... The problem is it's like, it's a little too late. That's the issue. Uh, the problem is that they chose their lane. Yeah. They're doing top down and they're doing top down really well. So now the onus is on us to not use that top down success as a proxy to be lazy and complacent from the grassroots bottoms up. For me, yeah. it's a challenge to step up and to really say, okay, where are the communities around the world that are proud to be part of NIR? Even to this day, I see people that go to an event and they're kind of shy, they mention NIR. I'm in Web3. That has to change. We need to have more people around the world able to speak confidently about what we're doing, to invite others to inspire others. That's, I think, the opportunity for the NDC. I'm actually kind of bullish on that it, side. It is. And I just want to elaborate when I said it's like a little too late. And that is that like when the bottoms up was like the strongest on near, the foundation was still trying to understand their overall vision and what they wanted to achieve. And now that they've gotten that together, like the community side has crumbled, right? And so they have this chicken and egg situation where you're trying to get a big brand in and they're like, hey, show us what's going on in the chain. And you can't really show them that much. That's where now the NDC needs to really prove itself over the next couple of months is that we need to bring in that strong user base and the strong crypto native side of it back into the fold. Um, we can dive into the economics of it soon, but I, I want to say there's three core parts of this. It's culture, it's governance, and it's economics. And you need all three there to really spark the life back into this ecosystem. Look at NFT transactions. Back in like February last year, 44,000 unique wallets per month transacting. 
And then that scales down to like in June, July, 4,000. And now we're in like the three digit number. Honestly, there's one person on the NFT side really keeping the ecosystem alive, and that's Escobar. This guy is involved in every core project, literally pushing on all angles. He is single-handedly keeping what is our NFT ecosystem like still pulsating on. And going from this like epic rise, we moved, we maybe grew too quickly, too soon. And we created this environment where we allowed mercenaries to come in and we devalued the missionaries in the space. And those mercenaries are good at getting grants. They're good at working the system. They're good at building communities. But then when they don't see the opportunity, they jump. And we're not an ecosystem that has room for mercenaries. We really can only focus on the missionaries. A hundred percent. Look, the way that I describe it to people is, and I remember, oh, dude, this is bringing back some flashbacks. Mm. I remember being in Sydney on a bus wearing a horrible suit. It's gray, dirty, lawyer look. It was like the very end of my time at a law firm in Sydney. And I was on my way to meet with the head of innovation or whatever, one of the consulting companies. He was doing legal tech. And on my way, I was listening to a podcast with Reid Hoffman. And he said, you need to understand where you are in your career and what you want. He said, a profession, if you're a professional, you go in, you do a job and you get out and you get paid for that job. They can replace you. You can find a similar job elsewhere. It's very transactional. And the terms of the interaction need to be fair, understood up front, etc. But then there is a vocation. When you have a vocation, you rise up to the challenge of your time. Did I want to be a career politician in here? Probably not what I had in mind when I was looking for ways to earn a living kind of thing. But it's understanding that there is a window of opportunity to do something. Something has to be done right. And you shape shift, you adapt, you learn. You do whatever it takes to keep ticking on to the next milestone. There has to be a larger vision in there. And I think that's what we've seen in the ecosystem. By the way, not just near, all of Web3. There was a tourist, the speculators, and there's people that have that sort of, there's something else in their court. Honestly, you could probably take the money away from all of us, and we won't be happy and we'll probably starve, but we're not going to go away. And by the way, that was my biggest frustration with the marketing DAO. I was like, this is six months too late, and money issues were an issue. But I was like, I can't leave. I can risk this collapsing. So yeah, at some point, I felt like I was being taken advantage of, and it was extremely unfair. This is the thing I see with the NDC, right? For all the OGs, the people who see this as a vocation, the people who have gone through blood, sweat, and tears building and being a part of this, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to the ecosystem to participate in this governance because you are now at the driver's seat. If you look at what NDC was originally, what it was conceived a year ago, to what it is now, it has become a far more democratic, community-driven initiative that gives everyone a voice. If you look at the first iteration of it, there was a house of stake. And the house of stake was basically the voting body. And so it meant that the people who had the most amount of near made, had the largest impact on decisions. Had a switch to the, what we have now, where it's one person, one vote per seat. The only thing you need is to prove your humanity, the one person part of the equation. But normalizing and equalizing voice like that really empowers grassroots and the community because the collective voice decides what happens, not the people who have the largest stake. And for that democratic model, as opposed to whales decide. I think we, we definitely have the opportunity to be the, the human chain. Nobody else is doing this proof of humanity stuff. Nobody has like SBTs and are using them the way we are to just tie that right into governance. And now we're seeing groups approach us to use our SBT protocol that NDCs develop for their own applications. And we're all for that. We're seeing the rise of discord gating done via I am human SBTs. So now you've got communities that are fully and organically human. And I'm excited to see that part of the experiment grow out because very shortly projects well, who want users can just gate their projects. Hey, if you have an SBT, great. Like you, you have now a way to identify, is this a bot or a script or the same person doing things a thousand times over, or is this a unique user? And I think the NDC is an interesting experiment. I think it's uh, an experiment for sure. Yeah. 
You know what happened in in France when one person, one vote, they kept jacking up the taxes on the rich, mm-hmm. and tax and wealth tax and all sorts of tax. They all left to Belgium and eventually had to roll back all those changes because the tax base was gone. So look, I, as a lawyer, I always like to see both sides of the argument, not because the current way of doing things is wrong, but because there needs to be an awareness, right, of what are the different scenarios in the experiment. I think that it goes without saying that if the largest stakers, that some of them could have millions, tens of millions worth of near, they see that the mob starts going against their interest, we know what's going to happen. They're going to dump, they're going to fork, and they're going to start again somewhere else. Like the chances of near getting forked in the next five years is not zero. So it's a it's an interesting experiment. I have some personal PTSD because I grew up in Venezuela and I saw that mob. The problem with the mob is that they're five years too late. When they see the consequences of their actions, they've already been up the ass and they're on the floor trying to recover. Like it's the people that get affected first that they have to react and get out. And yeah, that's why aligning incentives in a way that everyone has the same pulse check is super important. We can probably dive into the structure of the NDC. I know that there's been a lot of work going into it to ensure that there's checks and balances and all sorts of little mechanisms in place to to make it as optimal as possible. Yeah, look, let's talk about where those checks and balances lie. So they don't lie in the voting body. The only check and balance in the voting body is that it's, you have to prove your humanity. That's it. Nothing stopping you from being a voter. Where the checks and balances come in is the OG SBT criteria. So who's able to run for candidacy in the first election? And then to what extent can they do a thing once they're elected? And having a balance in that, it's very difficult to make one vote and rug the whole community treasury. There, there are guardrails put into place for that. And in addition to those guardrails, like the community can also veto something as well. It's weird in terms of when building a democratic process, you need to understand where the balances should be put in place and you shouldn't put those balances on the people voting because then you run into voter restriction and who can and can't be a voter and it doesn't make it enticing for new people to join the ecosystem and start to participate in governance. It has to be very thought out. And that's where it's taken time to get all this together. It's in the minutiae of how do you make this fair and balanced? And how do you also ensure that people can do experiments, but there's experiments, there's risk mitigation applied to those experiments. Yeah. I think the biggest thing here and what's important for the next six to nine months is that we want to reestablish grassroots funding and we want people to come into the ecosystem and start doing things be it building or participating or consuming, it's to to show that, hey, there's a place for you here. But I do have some issues and I dive into that. And that is, at the moment, we look at like grassroots DAOs and what they're meant to do. And I think they're important. So I don't want to downplay that at all. But I think we need to put a lot more thought into this. Because if you look at the way funding will work in its current form and the way groups have come together to create these constellations, it's their funding projects. And the problem with that is that money effectively leaves the ecosystem. What you're doing is you're paying somebody to build a thing that's effectively a source of income. Now there's nothing wrong with that, but in the midterm and even in the short term, that in itself does not restart the ecosystem. There has to be a lot more thought into how do we go back and build that middle class in near, how do we build a consumer class? or a service industry, putting more thoughts into that. It's not just enough to start funding projects. You need to entice people to buy, (laughs) to do transactions. And I've not heard enough from everyone in the ecosystem about that part of it. There's a concept in economics called the Gini coefficient, and that is the distribution of an asset amongst a number of people. And the more concentrated that is, the worse of a sign that is for economics. Having a broader concentration of near amongst wallets or some more wallets, like what you want is you don't want a concentrated ecosystem. And so a lower Gini coefficient is better for economics than a higher one. And thinking about ways to 
entice that and to build that into the ecosystem and into the future things that get funded is an important part of the equation. Like how do we increase transactional velocity? How do we get more people buying and how do we get near changing hands on chain? And yeah, that's like a conversation I want the community to have more. We're not having enough of This is the beginning of it, my friend. Let's kick open this can of worms. Look, def- there was a, def- a really, yeah. Like this is more than democracy. This is democratic capitalism. And I think that's the frame in which people need to understand governance from that it's not governance alone. There's an economy that goes alongside of it. And then the third part of this trifecta is the culture as well. So you need to nail all those three things to see a healthy ecosystem restart and us going back to the great heights we were before. There is a beautiful interaction. I'm not going to say names, but the document is technically public. (laughs) There's a beautiful interaction in the comments of one of the documents that you sent me. The first comment says that the $2 million budget is not enough, revise it up to seven. And then it talks about the monthly remuneration of different positions from 5,000 down to two and a half. And somebody else says four. And then let's call it the highest in the food chain says maybe one and a half. So I think that the many challenges that we have are, especially when looking at the lessons of history, understanding that just because it makes something legal or on paper, there's nothing wrong, like that is the process, or we all agreed on to this, quote unquote. There is a problem. I've always had an issue with the approach of creating a jobs program. When I create a jobs program, hire developers. Look at the dev hub. Show me what you're yeah. shipping and create value for others. Then you get paid. A bureaucracy that is looking at spending magnitudes of order more than the money that we've raised as an ecosystem. I look at the town halls. We've got to look at the numbers. Where is the growth coming from? If there's no growth, we have to identify areas for growth and invest in those. So I think that's where I'm trying to be open-minded, but also acknowledge that somehow universal basic income worked its way into the NDC. So you have to understand, okay, small groups of people over many months, maybe there's a filter bu- a, a, a bubble and they all figure it out. No one else is in these conversations. It's too late to change it. We can get 5K each. A few of us live in countries where that's equivalent to fifty thousand dollars a month. Winning winner chicken dinner, like it's a yeah. Look, I, I know, and on that point specifically, that's something we are reviewing heavily because within the GWG, actually, we agree that it needs to be lower significantly, and that is there's, there's two things that go in hand, right? I think people should be compensated for the time that they put into a thing, but there needs to be minimum thresholds as well, and there should be yeah. If you want to create a form of incentives. Then put it on a, put it on, put some targets associated with it. Not opposed to people getting paid, but they need to prove their worth. And if this first Congress goes and does this incredible Hail Mary and the near ecosystem is thriving and reviving and it's all great, then those Congress people, yeah, should be compensated accordingly. But if it's just more of the same and nothing happens, they don't deserve a single penny. So but once again, like the, they should do the blunt instruments. I'm not, I've never been a big fan, but the UN has a very interesting way of betraying compensation. Like the very granular, where you're based, you know, where your home base is, how many children you have, like your age and your seniority. It's impossible to find out how much a role pays in the UN because there's a lot of the specific factors of each individual that goes in. At least it was like that you know, 10, 15 years ago when I looked into it. I think that we should be the same with the NDC. Acknowledge that two and a half thousand dollars for me in Australia is nothing, but two and a half thousand dollars for me in Colombia, it's more than double a full month salary. What are my incentives to do it here, and why are the incentives to do it there? Are you going to get the same quality of work done, the same quality of people coming forward, the same motivations? So here's where we should say, okay, let's have a baseline. Maybe let's index. And by the way, if you index, only index upwards. Don't fuck people over if they yeah. already happen to live in a country where things may not be as prosperous as others. Uh, I'm not here to take money away from people. I'm here to make it fair for the rest of us. Did you live in Denmark? 40% of it's going in tax. We're not getting the same money. You're not getting the same quality of work. So I think that's where the nuance comes in. Even things like seniority. To acknowledging that some people's time is worth money. You want to sit down with someone for an hour. Even if they're not charging you, there is a lot of value being lost for what they could have been doing elsewhere. 
So asking them to be part of governance, which a lot of people we actually need, almost like as a safeguard and as like a steward of the ecosystem, that's extremely valuable. These are people that could probably be funding their own projects or who knows doing what. So I feel like that's a lot of the new ones that we should have. I do think people should get paid, but also it's always an afterthought, right? It's okay. Let's see where the value comes in first. And if it makes sense, no one's going to argue against it. I also don't understand that these people are public servants and so that there's a cap. They should never, these salaries should never outdo what they could earn in the private sector. Like metaphorically, I know this is all private sector, but like being a part of governance, being an elected official, you should treat as a civil servant type of role. But who is saying this and where do they live? Because the lived reality is Singapore pays their public servants very well. In fact, the president's the best one paid in the world. And everyone else, the Bolivians that claim they're not getting paid, they're all multimillionaires. Look at the U.S. politicians. 200,000 salary a year, 200 million at worst. I am transparent and I can tell you that I resigned the marketing DAO because $2,000 a month was a fucking joke. And I'm making $8,000 creating content and working for other people. I could have stayed and I could have given myself the money through my role because it was possible. I had some principles, but you can't do that when there's 45 people across an entire organization where even the people were the, meant to be the checks and balances, they all understand that they don't get paid. So it's okay to take a little bit of a cut on the side. Dude, we're looking at a $7 million budget. So once again, let's get things right from the start. Crystal clear, keep it clean, and yeah. This is where, so let's talk about constellations, right? So when I was putting together the NFT charter, I was conscious about this part of it. And that is that for me, it's like OPEX should not go more than 20, 25% of the total budget. There just should be like a hard cap on that. So understanding that part of it, how do you fairly compensate people? Maybe then reduce the number of people there or actually make the roles more specific. So one of the biggest splits for us in the NFT group is that you've got two core roles, the core contributor and the council member. Core contributors do the day-to-day. They're going to be spending a lot more time on it. You're going to look at their weeks being 20, 30, 40 hours in their week dedicated on this while the council members are only just doing uh, voting on funding decisions. So the reality is that their time spent on a month is going to be maybe five to 10 hours. And the council members at the moment, we have set to make a thousand dollars a month and the core contributor is just 3000. We're also going to look at exploring incentives based on performance, but that's also after the DAO becomes sustainable. So one of the things to understand is that we're not limited to being this vehicle that just distributes funds to the ecosystem. Strategic decisions can be made that make the ecosystem better, that then in turn benefit the DAO. And all of these constellations and you think about how they become sustainable over time and become effectively like sustainable ecosystem funds, if you will. But what I don't understand is if the new foundation calls me or Pagoda or Proximity or anyone, we have a conversation around what are the needs for the role? And how much do I think I'm worth, et cetera. It's, it should be an open conversation because once again, and I've told this to the regional DAO team as they were working through their charter, the issue with having fixed amounts is that you only ever get people that the fixed amount is actually more than they would have asked for. And you don't get anyone, obviously, to the fixed amount is just below what they would have asked for. So it's a very bad the, recruiting strategy. The fixed amount should be associated to a very specific ta- set of tasks that need to be done. And then any other task above that, that the DAO requires should be created as a bounty that anyone can publicly apply for, be it a core contributor or a council member or anyone, but then they are democratically or through a certain yeah, criteria yeah, yeah, yeah. for that. So I'm not opposed for people to get pay more, but they have to demonstrably do more to be paid more. And so one is having those minimum threshold of requirements and really explicitly defining what a core contributor does or a council member does. And then any other task should be then a public bounty that anyone could apply for. So then ultimately the best person for that gets that role or that specific action. And this is the issue with like, is that if you don't explicitly define stuff, then you'll have this discrepancy of one core contributor does a lot more than another core contributor does. 
But, but, but at the root, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't distinguish the importance of a task and the skills and the experience that go into creating it properly, I didn't spend seven years at law school and got a double degree and invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in my education and work at a law firm in Web3 litigation for nine months to write a charter that the lawyers charges over $30,000 to review what I wrote. I didn't get paid. And if you yeah. see that as a task that is interchangeable and any fucker can do for $1,000, they can. But that charter is now the bedstone for disaster. And if you have as a task, whatever, write a job description for somebody else, it's just a cascading effect of we're not really getting the job done properly. Look, I start with a marketing DAO. The reason why the charter is very explicit about people that are very active in the ecosystem, et cetera, is because it is virtually impossible to show up, look at a proposal, and be able to make a decision. If that's when your clock is running, you're not really going to make a decision that makes sense at all. You could wing it. And the reality is everyone else basically sided with me because it takes a lot of knowledge about the ecosystem, about the vertical, about the applicant. There's meetings before and after to approve and discuss, to follow up, to report. There's just a lot of work that, once again, like if you want to have very high strategic decision makers deciding on proposals that could be hundreds of thousands at a time, doing it for a thousand dollars is insane. It's just not valuing their time. I, I, I get that. I get that. It's something that I've thought a lot about myself and where I see myself in the ecosystem. And after a lot of thinking, I'm not going to run for any of the constellations, nor am I going to run for the core bodies. And the reason for that is because I still feel I'm a builder at heart and I want to continue building. It's just that it's hard to build in an ecosystem where there are no users and there's no businesses. And so it's like, I need to fix that first before I can then actually go and build stuff. I have a lot of cool ideas I want to implement. And my cool ideas aren't just sitting on a council and voting. I don't mind participating. So like all of the time that I contribute to the NFT work group is without any pay. And it will continue to be like that for, forever. Yeah, I don't see myself running for any position. I don't want to make that like a hard no that my thoughts won't change a year or two down the line. But for me, it's that actually I just need this ecosystem to come back to life so I can go back and continue building in it. I, will, I have a lot of stuff I want to release. I want a lot. I can't do that if there's no users. But how does that reconcile with the current role that you have? Does that mean that the role is ending at some time soon? Oh, yeah. The GWG roles, like, this is our last quarter. Q3 and we're all gone. That doesn't mean I might not take on another position within the ecosystem. So there's two types of groups below the core body. There's the, so, you know, you've got the core bodies of government, the House of Merit, the Council of Advisors, the Transparency Commission. Then you've got your constellations. And then you have your orthogonal nodes and your orthogonal nodes are basically everything that isn't a funding node. And so we're looking to build out a public goods industry. We're looking to build out service industries and a lot of other different things that will all be a part of the NDC. And I do see myself doing something in the orthogonal nodes, but actually I, what I really see myself doing in the end is just going back to being a builder and building more stuff. I really want what to would you, What would you say to someone that cynically would say that the NDC is putting some people in place on a very modest salary to then fund huge budgets for or talk on old notes or this service industry that we're propping up? Okay, so there are caps, right? So no single node can get more than 150K per month. That's the hard cap for the what the House of Merit can do for funding. The reality is that if they can't get their proposal through, they'll get no funding. And a part of that is having like very strict scrutiny around those budgets. I don't like, I think it's unreasonable for a one person node or a three person node to go and request 150,000 per month to go and I don't know, do a thing. Like this is where hopefully. I mean, but, but it doesn't process. have to be 150. If you were to look at the fairness and the integrity of the system. You're asking for somebody getting paid two and a half to give you 10 per month. You could push it to 20, 25, depending on what the scheme is. You can see how the people setting up the system are setting up a system that could potentially benefit some groups over others. I'm just wondering what the response would be to somebody that may question the alignment overall. I don't have a particular well, view on well, it either well, way. 
this is where the safeguards come in place, right? And that is first, it needs to get like a proposal needs to be made. And that proposal needs to be sponsored by one person from the House of Merit, then co-signed by one person from the House of Merit. Then it goes through a vote. After the vote happens, let's say it's approved, the Council of Advisors has an opportunity to veto it. And then on top of that, even if they don't veto it, the community can come in and vote to veto it. Sorry, I guess I'll restructure my statement because I realized that it had a very negative tone. Let's assume that the proposals are legitimate. Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with the proposal. I'm going to get $50,000 a month to build whatever widgets on BOSS. Is it still reasonable to have a group of people on 2500 granting other group of people properly remunerated and pro- presumably taking into account all the variables or maybe some negotiations? I guess I'm just trying to reconcile how we can bring in that nuance to both bodies because it seems to me like the ecosystem so, so- is so early stage. Given yeah, the choice, so I we get, all want to be I a guess service like, provider. Being in the house of merit is not mutually exclusive to being a service provider, but all, so how do I explain this? The house of merit role is something that will be very time consuming and very important to have, but it doesn't leave you to only exclusively doing that. So you could hypothetically, let's say, be a core contributor for the marketing DAO, but also be a member of the House of Merit. Now you have to declare any conflicts of interest and you have to recuse yourself from voting on anything that you could personally benefit from. So there are measures put in place where like, I don't know, I just, I wouldn't expect people to be running for those positions and those positions being their sole source of income, because if you're credible enough you would have established a business already in the space. You'd already be able to take care of yourself. And this is an additional thing that shouldn't be strictly your sole role. Now that might not be always the case. There might be somebody who is only doing that, but then they have to be comfortable with only making two and a half thousand per month. Yeah. The challenge is that the maths on the income side is obviously super flexible. Obviously you can have multiple roles and supplement with different streams of income. And the gig economy has been there for a long time. The issue is that the maths on the time side, that's where things get really messy. Like when I was signed Metapool, I basically told Claudia, look, if I were working one job, I would be getting overtime. And at some point, it has to be worth it. Like they have to acknowledge that when I do the work, it's my 10th, 11th, 12th, 14th hour in a day in a time zone where it's always terrible, very early in the morning, very late at night. Like you go to the point where if none of my roles acknowledge that sacrifice, I just had to get rid of some of them. And it happened yeah. to the marketing DAO. I was like, why am I spending so many hours doing something where the income doesn't increase with the number of hours? And that's what I was, you know what? I could just go spend those same hours elsewhere and not be broke and not become fat and depressed and gray hair, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. so th- that's the question where I'm trying to balance out. If we want to get like a C1 FAR type personality in, We've got a business to run. Like how many hours can we get from them for whatever the remuneration we're contemplating maybe? This is also where that the goes back to minimum thresholds. There's an expectation of how much they need to do and that needs to be sufficient enough to do those tasks. I think the one that'll be the most time consuming will be the house of merit in that you need to originate a proposal. Those proposals need to be voted on and thoroughly examined and understood. And like the... It's a good question, right? And it's, I don't have this like clear cut answer for it because you have to balance out remuneration where it should be fair and sufficient enough for somebody. But at the same time, what you don't want is like 15 people being paid 5,000 a month each and no funding goes out to the ecosystem. But it's cool. How do you design incentive based system for that as well? And so for the good, yeah. See, the issue for me. And I've had many calls with players about this. And I love it that we agree when we have a call, by the way, we, and we've implemented things like default dead and he wants me to chip in into the compensation group if possible. The challenge, and once again, just wearing the cynical hat of somebody who has traveled the world and spoken to one too many people and for the most time representing the marketing DAO, which has had its challenges and whatnot. The thing that some people would point out is that things are very clearly set up by the people who are going to be immediately involved, if that makes sense. Let's put it differently. If we task a third party with figuring out payment, 
it would look differently. And if yeah. that's the case, then we should probably go back to the drawing board and say, okay, where are we maybe motivated by natural personal interests? Which are not wrong. We just got to be aware of those influences. I'll give you an example. I really like the Gini coefficient analogy. I just think that theory and reality sometimes can be hard to reconcile, but maybe we can get the Pikes Peak team and had Didier in the last podcast. Maybe we could ask them, just for fun, to do an analysis of the grassroots DAOs, how much near handed over was sold, how much within 24 hours, how much within a week, a month. I know that I was the asshole that staked it all and I got liquidated on the way down. I never really sold much. <laughs> for people that claim that I've extracted all this money, I'm back <laughs> to zero. Like, I never yes. really cashed out. So I wouldn't blame people that did. But it's just something interesting to take into account because I would personally support something like, okay, let's negotiate with people. What are your living expenses? We want to make sure that you're looked after. Anything above that, if you want to do it, we lock it yeah. to one year time, lock it to two years time. And th those are the kind of long-term incentives where the way that I've often described it is, how can we have incentives in place where I'm not working by the hour? I did that once as a lawyer and I hated it. I'm not working on a, even a task base. Because the problem with that is startups need you to do whatever it takes to achieve a goal. Like it's mission driven. It's not task driven. You can do it in order GPT style and identify a bunch of tasks, but we need people to be very proactive. So we need to find a group of people that become savages in doing whatever it takes to make sure that their bag is worth it in two years time. How does the foundation does lock near? How does Pagoda does lock near? But just something for the NDC. It could be milestone yeah. based. If we don't get X million number of transactions, X million number of wallets, we need people to aggressively pursue those targets. We need to have 20 funded projects in year by the end of the year. External capital. Not bullshit that we can fudge. Oh, shit. Now the metrics change. Now we stop yeah. jerking each other off of around I am human and we go push these projects. And if we don't have them, we find those founders and we bring them in and we find the capital. We make the introductions. We find the users and handhold them and give feedback for the UX. That's where I want to be because I already yeah. hold the bag. And I see that I could get paid a salary, quote unquote, or I could do meaningful work. Like I want to get outsized returns. This is not a job for me. This is yeah. A, have the impact in the world and generational money. If I wanted a job, I'd go to a Web2 industry. It's way yeah. easier eh? and way better money. So th that's my mindset. I know that it's not a popular one and it doesn't have to be everyone's mindset. But we can probably meet somewhere in the middle. I agree with you. I think the issue we run into is balancing it out because 7 million seems like a lot. But then at the same time, when you actually break it down, it's not a lot. If you have 10, 15 different constellations, all request or, and orthogonal loads, all requesting 50 to 100K each, you run out of that money in six months time. And so it's, what do we want to do? Let's think about the next six months. The next six months, we need to show that governance works and is a solid vehicle for help for funding the ecosystem. Once that experiment's proven, like Ilya initially wanted to commit a hundred million near to the NDC. That's very different from the X number of near there is now. I think it's like seven to $8 million worth. But the, the problem is the denominator, right? And this is why yeah. doing quarterly funding is so interesting. There's obviously a larger market trends, but the reality is, if we do it dollar-based, up until now, people could even request to receive USDC from grassroots verticals, even remove the annoyance of having to sell. If we do it dollar-based, there's no risk. And if it's just a job, it's a different equation. Because Marik will tell you, if I hire someone for $5,000 a month, they are my bitch. And the standard and the delivery are probably 150 times more than what any of these entities people are doing combined. So that's when we start to understand, okay, $5,000 a month as an employee, you're not our employee. You're doing something from your living room whenever you can. And I can tell you from the marketing down about PTSD, but it will happen again. People disappear for weeks at a time. And they show up, they save grace, whatever. Decentralized autonomous, no one can tell me shit. Vote me out in six months time after I leech all the money. These are the things that we need to avoid. If we yeah. change the denominator, and we say baseline is X amount for everyone. If near goes to seven bucks, guess what? Community treasury doesn't have seven million bucks. It's got 50 million. Okay. Now we can talk about 
the value that we have created collectively. Is it going to be on the NDC only? No. But if anyone in the ecosystem is in a position to put wheels in motion, would be those people. But this is the decision-making level, making introductions. I came back to Australia. I'm thinking of a very aggressive growth strategy down here. I wouldn't second guess doing what I'm doing here right now. And even last week during Australia Blockchain Week, I met a lot of corporates, a lot of universities. I wouldn't even think about doing House of Merit over what I'm doing here, unless I can have that influence higher level. What if what we're cooking here, we can start cooking everywhere? That's where things get spicy for me. And once again, yeah. at that point, if Nier goes from 1 billion to 10 billion, we all take home 100K. I don't give a, but we need to generate that 9 billion worth of value. That's always yeah. been our view. That's always been Aussie's view. That's what we negotiated back in the day for the WAP speed guilds that, well, didn't quite work out. But it's about having those incentives and make sure that the challenge is we have to filter people, but once they're in, to give them the incentives, give them discretion, give them scope to fuck it up, but curse correct and keep going. And yeah, it's, it's very messy, but we only need to get it right a few times. And then it's a different story. I very much agree with you there. I think that incentives conversation, lock near conversation needs to come into play. I, I'm just conscious of the maths of it now in the first Congress, but that doesn't mean it's not a thing that can't happen. It's one of those things that we're spending active time on it in the compensation group. And it's not just for the, like the politicians, if you will, it should be everyone that's being funded via the NDC, the projects as well. And even if it's not your full thing is in her lock near, like a certain person or stake should be in, in a form of lock near. I agree with your opinion. I don't disagree with you at all. It's the um, understanding the maths of first establishing like a fair base and then do the rest in, in, in locked incentives. This is like the startup model. You get a bunch of equity that has like a four year vesting schedule and you work like blood, sweat and tears to bring the value of your shares up as much as you possibly can. And then the real payday, like everything you make on your salary is just enough to wash your face. The real payday is when you've taken this like pre-seed ID and made it into a unicorn. And that's when everyone pat themselves on the back. And so I don't disagree with you at all. It's just explicitly defining the best way to, to do that. And then understanding what extent of the treasury we have in place that can accommodate something like that. But there are a lot of people talking through that at the moment. It's just in this governance wheel, there's like a billion things that need to be built out. So. This is one of the more pressing matters. It's just, this is where getting more people in the conversation, because it's really good to have these like surface level thoughts about it, but really breaking down what that actually looks like explicitly is the, where the challenge lies. And at the moment, we're still at that discourse stage of this conversation. We've not been able to yeah. go through the exercise of breaking down the minutia. I told Blaze, and I think he's already started that exercise. I was like, Blaze. Let's do it the other way around. Push and pull. Instead of us saying, hey, this is how much this role is going to get paid and then hoping somebody comes and take it, let's do it the other way around. Let's create a list of people that we think would be really good for that role, especially something like a first Congress. Dude, it's a big undertaking. They're going to be paving half the roads as they drive at high speed. As liability issues, like the legal landscape, it's murky in, in some regions. And let's do like a user research group. Hey, Chloe, how much would you expect for this role? We need you for six months. Cloud, how much would you expect? We need you for six months. Because that's what we're going to realize. There's going to be, yeah, a lot of known unknowns that we need to tease out. I think I told you, and I definitely told Blaze. See, the, the problem that we're making is we're assuming that money is the only variable. And once again, this may be a natural shortcoming of people that are already in and just want to make sure that they get remunerated or they inject in their expectations. An equal, if not greater one, is reputation. Reputation is really is the most valuable. Nobody's going to join the house yeah. of marriage for the money. But if their reputation is at stake, they won't do it. That's as easy as that. If they stand to, I guess, enhance their reputation, or if there's like a brand match. And I said with the podcast, by the way, if there are guest requests and I realize that they're leaning on my brand, it's taken me a long time to build, to prop them up. I'm really happy to do it, but it can go the other way around. 
I'm not willing to have people that will drag me down. So it's a yeah. it's a very interesting dance where sure money is a way that we try to quantify everything so that we can shake hands. But it's really understanding like what is motivating people. And there's negative motivations as well. Like I mentioned undisclosed dubious attempts to grab power. They may say I'll do it for free. But then you got to be like, well, what are they going to do when they go in? There's just so many variables that, once again, kudos to you and the people on the inside that I can see doing great work. I may come join you and help out. I know that we are, I have lost track of time, but what we can do is pretend I know nothing, although I did my research, I swear. Actually, I'm back home now and I've got the document open. But pretend that people listening may be interested after our very rich and heated conversation on checking out some of the roles, potentially putting their hand up, they may have some suggestions on how to address some of these issues. What do you think about running through each one of the houses and each one of the roles? Quick overview so that people know what to expect. And also let's make sure that we touch on some important dates. I know that there's going to be a lot happening in the next quarter. So we want to go through from the point of view of the three core bodies, what they do, what their functions are and like the roles within them. Yeah. Yes, please. Cool. So look, we've got the House of Merit and the House of Merit is, it's got a, a couple of core responsibilities. So, you know, its purpose is to vote on operational matters, including budget allocation, long-term strategy, hiring and mechanical changes. And then you've got 15 members there. They serve a term of six months and their specific like focuses are proposals for the congressional setup package. And this defines like what are big budget items, what are recurring items, what are the procedural or timers. So this is an operational setup of how the next six months will go for them. It's one of the first core votes they'll make. Then they'll have proposals for budget allocation. And this is deployment of funds from the treasury for ecosystem specific purposes. Then they've got a few other kind of responsibilities that aren't as important as the budget allocation, but they're still there. So proposals for constitutional amendments and governance framework changes. So they have the ability to modify the constitution or elements of the government's governance framework. They have the ability to propose what the official long-term strategy should be. So vote on priorities and strategies of the Congress. And then they have the vote to hire. So they have the ability to create and fund positions within the NDC for a specific role. So those are the core functions. They come up with proposals and those proposals define where funding for the community treasury will go. And then they go and do repeat votes on them if they're like one-off items or monitor their progression, if they're recurring items. That's in essence what it does. And actually the council of advisors and they are effectively a form of oversight. They have the ability to set the overall agenda for the Congress of what are like the core areas we should be looking at and focusing on. They have the ability to veto over the House of Merit and the Transparency Commission. So they can help approve or veto a setup package. So that first vote the House of Merit goes, they can either expedite the passage of this or they can veto against that. And then they have the veto ability to veto an active or implemented proposal. The House of Merit initiates a proposal. The Council of Advisors is observing it and understand and sees that, okay, there's an issue here. They have the ability to veto that. They are the ones who set the formal priorities of Congress. So they clarify the priorities the council sees the most important and to indicate what type of proposals may or may not be the, the most successful. So this is guidance of what should or shouldn't be acceptable for the types of proposals put through by the House of Merit. And then they have the ability to signal a vote on the body's performance of both the House of Merit and the Transparency Commission and recommend them either improve their performance or course correct. And then finally, their last one is the ability to reinstate banned members. So if the Transparency Commission banned somebody, the House, the Council of Advisors has the ability to reinstate those members. So th this is a, an oversight body that just effectively ensures that the House of Merit is funding appropriately. Then the Transparency Commission, this is the investigative body and the enforcement body. So their goal is to maintain governance, initiate investigations, remove members and qualify candidates for elections. Yeah, they have uh, the ability to have a motion to investigate. So they can open an investigation against an individual elected to an NDC body. 
they have the ability to remove, so the motion to remove, and that is removing a person from their post, leaving the post empty until the next election cycle. They have a motion to ban, so removing a person from their post and banning them from serving in any government body in the future. And they have a motion to reinstate, and that is reinstating a banned member. So those are the core bodies and the core functions. And the idea is that they are a system of checks and balances amongst themselves. We're working through at the moment, minimum thresholds for all of these positions. For example, meeting attendance, you should be attending 60 or 70% of your meetings per month, voting on proposals, be it for it or against it, or even an abstain vote on at least 70% of proposals per month. For the House of Merit, looking at like proposal creation as well. So a minimum threshold for how much they must create in a term. And we're still expanding on those. So this is the baseline for their core functions and, and minimum thresholds. Does that give you kind of a, a better understanding of the core bodies? Another core thing I've not said explicitly, but I should, the voting body has a lot of power. Outside of just voting for members to serve in each institution, they have the ability to dissolve an institution. So if there is enough dissatisfaction by the community, they can come in and dissolve a whole house. They have the ability to amend the constitution they have the ability to vote, veto large budget items. They have the ability to veto recurring budget items. They have the ability to, what's it called? Add additional trustees or exclude trustees from the trust. They have the ability to amend trust instruments and they have the ability to make distributions. We've got to go back and check what make distributions actually entails. But one thing we understand is the voting body has a lot of power. Now there are like minimum quorums that need to be met and then certain votes in favor. So be it a simple majority or super majority, depending on the importance of what they can do. But there are the ultimate decision maker in this. So if the community is super upset about the way the NDC is running or super disappointed with the way a certain body is. They can come together and just vote it down. They can, that's a very powerful thing that doesn't exist in the existing like government landscape is that there are vehicles put into place for the community to dissolve full bodies of government. If they are not happy with the results produced, it, it's the sack everyone. They can then hold, they can, yeah, they can then hold another vote to change the way that body works. But this is specifically like just removing everyone who's in office in that position. Yeah. So a couple of things is that we need to have a minimum quorum to vote anybody in to begin with. That number is like around the five, 600 mark to be able to like establish NDC V1 governance with respect to like worst case scenarios and like only a select few group of people being able to decide if somebody goes through and buys 500 people and votes on a thing like worst case scenario, isn't that the whole treasure gets drained. For me, the worst case scenario is that nothing happens and the next six to nine months is a very critical time for near. And so nothing happening is the worst case scenario because we already have a bunch of builders on the fence. There are a lot of people who have been here who are like, okay, what do we do here? How can we like build a DAO or build a business here? They will, they will likely find another ecosystem to go to. So for me, a cabal coming together and trying to do something, the worst they could do is, yes, maybe they're able to siphon a small amount of funds for themselves, but ultimately the worst they will do is inaction and inaction will lead to a stagnating ecosystem. What's our focus for Q3 as the GWG within the NDC? Voter education, candidate education, voter turnout, candidate turnout. Those are all important things. And where my explicit focus is around educating all candidates to be ready to run. And that is, if you're running for the House of Merit, you're going to need to be drafting and voting on proposals once you're in the House of Merit. So the candidate who has their act together and has started drafting proposals now will be in a much better position than the candidate who just, yeah, I'm interested in running and I feel strongly one way or another, but I've not really put any deeper thought into it. Another thing is voter turnout. So we're very conscious on we, our initial target was like getting a thousand voters on chain or a thousand humans on chain. Our new target is 3000. And then we also want to have as high of a voter turnout as possible. We have minimum thresholds, but we want to go far beyond that. And so the more voters you have as well, the more you can reduce collusion. 
and the more you can reduce this like cartel-like behavior and things like that. Everyone's worried about those in the shadows that'll come out of the way and all vote in one favor for a particular group. And now this one group owns the whole ecosystem. But the reality is that there's a lot of active groups right now that are all campaigning, that are building up their ecosystems, that are getting people involved in their local elections. You look at like regional communities, you look at the different work groups, they're already being very active in building up a community. Yeah. Yeah. I found a very interesting metric recently as well. James was very, well, he's been an OG in the ecosystem and he's very heavily involved with regional communities. He did a bit of analytics to look at all the people who are I am human and whether they had near social profiles. And it's 80% of people that I'm human don't have a near social profile. And that was interesting because what it showcases is that community is not yet all onboarded on near social. They're out there in the microcosm and their own little areas. Like look, a lot of the NFT community is not going to be near social. They're going to be on discord. So it's interesting to see, and I'm conscious that near social is not adopted enough yet to be the best measure of who's active, who's not active, who's making a difference in the ecosystem. It's still something that needs to grow significantly before it can really like have its foothold to do that because it, it is quite hard to get people out of where they're used to being. And yeah, they had a, they needed to have a reason to do something there. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Okay, so this is an interesting thing about what's vote buying versus me inviting my mom and my brother and sister onto, into the ecosystem, into doing I am human and stuff like that. And it's like, how can you create a system to ensure that you're encouraging new people to come, but you're also conscious that there's a propensity for abuse. And this comes back to like where the checks and balances need to be. And this is where my view is you should never do anything to restrict the voting body. Because if you're saying, oh, you're new to the chain, you just joined, you made your first in your wallet today. No, you can't vote. You're not allowed to do anything there. You have to be X months old or need to do X percent transactions. Like it's, uh, it, it will be right. But that's just like a process of campaigning. If you're legitimately wanting to run, you're going to need to campaign and you're going to work within the ecosystem and outside of the ecosystem to campaign. It's, uh, it's, it's on us at the NDC. I say re regional communities has a unique set of problems that no other constellation has in that inherent by their, the, what they're trying to serve requires a very interesting and robust system to deal with the dynamics of individual, like local communities on a global scale. And like, how do you properly do distribution of voting power? And that is, do you do it by population? Do you do it by who's the most active on chain? It's a whole set of dynamics. That's like very interesting because like near or like Australia as a region versus Asia or Africa are like, you're diff you're dealing with like vastly different demographics. You're dealing with vastly more candidates or less candidates. It's certainly a challenge. One is that. We're never going to make the perfect system on the first go round. And so being conscious of that, it's taking in these learnings when they happen and iterating until like the beast that will become the NDC is going to be very different than what we deploy in October's time or September's time, but that's fine. It's just like what we're focused on is a system of good enough as opposed to perfect, because it'll take forever to build perfect. And by the time perfect's ready, our assumptions would have changed and we'll be always in the state of, oh, it's not good enough. Another part of this as well is once these voters, be it new or existing, come in to vote, giving them other things to do and other things to learn about. And this is where voter education is so important. I'd love to see the rise of political parties within the NDC. It might be difficult for, let's say, the NFT DAO to get enough people to vote somebody into the House of Merit, or maybe it won't be but they still have other seats they have to vote on. So what decisions should they make then? And this is where, if there's like the grassroots party and all the different grassroots DAOs came together and they all campaigned for each other as well, if they agreed with each other. And also very quickly, we'll probably see what's called like the better grassroots DAO. These all are these like, these first go arounds, they're all, they're all subject to evolution. Something better will come out that'll be better at funding, that'll be better at raising community that'll be better at compensating. And that's the one that's going to win. Whether it exists in this initial cohort or not, like the opportunity for it to come about is definitely possible.
And so these are all micro experiments, not just as the NDC, but as funding constellation and as like the old guard of grassroots versus the new guard, there's going to be one that supersedes all of them and that'll become the better functional model. What we're just trying to do is create a sandbox for these experiments to occur. And that's the NDC. Having the ability to experiment, but also being conscious of the risks involved. So the first goal is let's deploy grassroots funding again, but this will evolve over time into being a way that we have a disintermediated and a decentralized system where it's not just the NDC, but the NDC is also assisting in the decision-making capacity and the funding capacity of proximity, Pagoda, the foundation, right? This is the glue that could down the line tie all of it together. So we truly end up with a decentralized ecosystem. And that's like the initial vision that like Ilya was building towards too, when he put forward the NDC as an idea in that, how do you truly decentralize this? It ends on us having, we have admitted the issues in the ecosystem. We know our challenges, but we're still hopeful and we're still bullish on near and the future we're trying to build. And that's like the ultimate message to the end. There's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of drama. Stuff went really well and stuff went really bad. And it's not for one particular project or one particular vertical. Everyone's been through the shared experience, but we're still here. And that's the important message that like, there's a part of us that still thinks for a better, brighter future that near plays. And we are aligned in that we want to do something, whatever that might be to make that happen. And this is where I think like the thing that ties it all together is the NDC can be very much that. Does it have the potential to be abused? Does it have potential nefarious characters in the phrase they're looking to go and take over power? Like everything does. The reality here is I, I don't think that's the worst case scenario in all of this. The worst case scenario is that we all like fizzle into mediocrity and nothing comes of all the hard work and effort we put in. That's the worst case. Not that like some group on the sides comes in and controls it all because there's enough. Both people. are bad. Yeah, both are bad. But for me, like the best case scenario is what we're looking towards here. That is that ecosystem restart actually near becoming its own unique identity. We're not the faster Ethereum. No, we're near. And what's Ethereum? Ethereum is just the slow near. That's what it is. Like. We've had, an, well, we've had an identity crisis, and I think coming out of it, we just really need to identify what we are and what we're trying to achieve. Here. Thank you so much, Alejandro. It's been a pleasure being on here, and I'm excited to get immortalized into the collection that is Wild User Interviews. That's the end of another episode. As always, I just want to thank you for listening, because let's be honest, you are amazing! And I also want to remind everyone that everything contained on this episode is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast shall be construed as financial, medical, or any other type of advice. And you should always consult with licensed professionals before making any financial decisions. Make sure that you like and subscribe so that you stay up to date with the latest episode. We've got a steamy hot pipeline of guests that will keep you entertained right through the bear market. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you soon. Bye.